Well, we're now ready to determine the futures price. How do we figure out what the futures price is? If we can observe a spot price, uh, and we know what the uh, market rate of return is and the time to maturity of the contract, what is the futures price, right? Well, we have a problem here because we have, uh, well, we have two problems. Time to delivery varies. It could be day one, day two, day three of the delivery period. T varies. And the bigger one, the cheapest to deliver, varies. And both of these, the time that is delivered and the deliverable is both at the option of the short position. And since they're at the option of the short position, they have value for the short position. So how do you value those options? Um, and it's because of that that the futures price is more difficult to determine. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a couple of assumptions here. If we assume that the cheapest to deliver is known, now that's not such a crazy assumption by the way. Most of the marketplace at any given time, it would be easy for any participant to identify at, and on any given day what the cheapest to deliver actually is. The problem is the cheapest to deliver can change over time. On shorter time periods, not so much, but on longer time periods, yes, the cheapest to deliver can change. But it's not a terrible assumption to make. It's actually a pretty valid assumption to make. So the cheapest to deliver is known. Also, T is known. And again, on short periods of time, that's a bit of a problem. But on longer periods of time, the, the difference between delivering on day one or day five is not a big deal over five years. But over six months, the difference of five days might be a big deal. So both of these assumptions, they're not controversial assumptions. They're not solid assumptions, but I, I think most people can live with them. Well, if we do make this assumption, then the futures price is based on an underlying with known income. Basically, if we know what the, what the delivery is, and we know T, we basically have an underlying with known income, so we have a futures price that's related to the spot price in this manner. The spot price minus I, remember now, I is the net present value of all payments during time T. I is not the income. I is the net present value of that. So uh, uh, S not minus I, and of course, uh, uh, continuously compounded for some market rate for some period of time, <clears throat> whatever the spot rate is, because we got to bring it into the future, right? So let's set up a scenario and see if we can't uh, um, play around with that scenario. So let's say that we have a bond with uh, semi-annual payments. Here's a payment date. Here's a payment date. Here's a payment date. We're going to buy it here. We're going to enter into the contract here. This is now. And we're going to, uh, the, the contract matures over here. So there we go. We're going to straddle a payment date in that case. Uh, we can observe a spot price in the market. And let's say we observe 115. Uh, and we're going to hold it for this period of time, which we calculate as 270 days. We have 122 days from the time we enter to the next payment date, and 148 days <clears throat> until the contract matures. We are 60 days away from the last payment date, and when it matures, there'll be 35 days left for the next payment date. So we have 182 days in this period, and we have... 183 days in that period. Now, all we're doing is we're just setting up a scenario. <clears throat> You're probably wondering where did I get all the numbers from. Well, it's just an example uh, of when we entered the contract, when we exited. I said, we're just saying, let's assume it's 270 days long, and this is the way the days fall out. Right? That's all we're doing. So, the um, cheapest to deliver... Again, we're saying T is known, so that's all we've done here is we've got the exact number of days. We've taken care of that. Now we have to take care of the cheapest to deliver. Let's say that we know that it is a 12% semi. Um, we know uh, the conversion factor. We can observe that. It's published. is 1.6000. And the interest, the market rate of interest right now is 10%. How do we determine a futures price on this? And this may look really challenging. <clears throat> but what I want you to do is I want you to focus on this formula. What do we need? We need a value for, for the spot, a value for the net present value of the interest payment, 
and we need our observable interest in the market, which we know is 10%. We know our time t is 270 days, so we've pretty much got this term all figured out. So to figure out f0, we, we still just need two, two variables, right? Well, remember now, uh, some of the house cleaning we did at the beginning of the chapter, um, if, we're, if we're entering into the contract uh, here, and we see the spot price at 115, remember now, we want to derive a futures price by using an arbitrage argument. The arbitrage argument would be, well, let's say that we buy the underlying and deliver it. What would be the futures price so there'd be no arbitrage opportunity? So if we buy the bond at 115, notice that we must pay some accrued interest. So the first thing we need to do is figure out, well, what would the cash price be? Because that's what we got to pay. But we're going to get some interest, so we got to figure out the net present value. So we really have to figure out these two variables. Once we have these two variables, we can figure out F0, can't we? Let's go ahead and see what that looks like. Okay, so here's our timeline preserved. Uh, I've just brought it to the top of the screen, and here's the assumptions on our uh, cheapest to deliver. And we need to solve a futures price and because of our assumptions we know that we can use this formula but we need we have we can see R we can see T we need S and we need I so we need a cash price because if we want to figure out the futures contract we're gonna go through that same argument before well what would an arbitrage opportunity look like so let's buy the underlying to buy the underlying we need a cash price and you'll recall that the cash price was the quoted price Plus, everybody say it with me now, any accrued interest. There we go. So what is our quoted price? Well, we're 115. And what is our accrued interest? Well, what are we looking at? We're looking at a 12% semi, which means it's $6 for what percentage of time? Well, since we've entered in, since we're buying it at this date, at the same date we'd enter the futures contract, 60 days have elapsed from a period of 182 days. So 60 over 182. And what would that give us? $116,978. So it'll cost us, we'll put out $116,978 on that day. We've got S0. There we go. So there's another puzzle piece of the puzzle missing. We need I. We still need I before we can figure out the solution to this. Well, what is I? I is the net present value of all payments received. So it is 6. We're going to receive 6 on this date, discounted backwards continuously by negative 0.1 times, how, how far back are we going? 122 days. We're bringing it back 122 days. Our T is 122 of 365, because it's for, that's how many days we're bringing it back. Don't fall into the trap of putting 122 over 182. That's not what we're doing. We're discounted back continuously uh, uh, for that period of time, which is 122 days out of 365, right? And that will give us 5.803. So now we have I. So it looks like we have all our variables. Do we have a value for S0? We certainly do, 116,978. Uh, do we have a value for I? We certainly do. We know our R and we know our T. So all we have to do is just take this formula here and start putting in our actual numbers. So S is 116,978 minus our I is 5.803. E to the R, what's our R? We're told is 10%, 0 0.1 times what's our T? We're holding it for 270 days of the year, 365. And oh, yeah, this is just calculator work at this point, so let's just jump right to, uh, to, to the number, 117, or sorry, 119711. So 119,711. That would be, we think, the futures price, but we're not done yet. I want you to think about this for a minute. We're trying to set up an arbitrage opportunity. If it were 119.71, there would still be an arbitrage opportunity because, remember, we're buying the underlying and we're selling a futures to figure out the price. So if we're buying the underlying, as of this maturity date, well, what would be owed to us? 
148 days of interest would be owed to us. So if it were 119.71, we still have an arbitrage opportunity that even if the futures price equal 119.71, when we deliver on that date, the person we deliver to must still pay us this 148 uh, for 148 days. So this is too high, isn't it? So let's make sure that we understand exactly what we're saying on the maturity date. On the maturity date, we will receive accrued interest for 148 days. So we have to reflect that accrued interest in the price. This is too high. If this were the price, we could do this all day long and make that accrued interest for free, right? So what's the accrued interest? Well, it's a 12% semi, so it's six times. And how many days are there? There's 148 days in a 183-day uh, period. From the last payment to the next payment, there's 183 days. We've held it for 148 of those days, which is $4.852. 4852. So now we're ready to make our final adjustment here. For there to be no arbitrage opportunity, the futures price must be equal to 119711 minus this extra interest we would receive just by holding it, 4852, which equals 114859. Do we think we're done? No, we are not done. We are not done. Remember the assumption we made was that the cheapest to deliver was known. That's the cheapest to deliver. What did we do? We figured out a futures price on this, on this bond. That's not the futures price of a T-bill contract. That's the futures price if this were the underlying. But here's the problem. Since it is the cheapest to deliver, it actually is the underlying, but it's not the definition of the underlying. The underlying is a government, a $100,000 standard government bond with 6% interest. This is a government semi at 12% interest, but we know the conversion factor is 1.6. So what that's saying is that this price represents 1.6 times what the futures price would be if it were, if it were the T-bond. So let's be clear about what this is. This over here is the futures price if the contract were written on the 12% bond, but it's not. It's not. So what we do is we say, well, if this 114.85 represents 1 1.6 times what a standard bond would be, 114.859 divided by the conversion factor would equal 71.79. There's our futures price on the T-bond contract with an underlying delivery of a government 6% bond. We've made the assumption that the cheapest to deliver is the 12% bond. So we get a futures price of 114.859 on that bond. Do not stop there. This is not a futures contract on this bond. It is a futures contract on a 6% semi, on a government 6% semi. Since we already know the conversion factor, what we're saying is that this must represent 1.6 times what a standard bond would be. So if we just divide it by the conversion factor, we will get the futures price for the standard. Notice that we cannot calculate the futures price directly from the standard. We have to say, well, we got to make a couple assumptions. What's the cheapest to deliver? And let's assume that T is known. T will be the first day or whatever the case is that T is known. So those two assumptions are in there. But that adds uncertainty to the price, doesn't it? It adds uncertainty. So the price may not, the price may be lower to reflect that uncertainty in reality. Now, if it's a short period of time, um, the assumption about the cheapest to deliver is a safe assumption. If you're going out five years or six years, the assumption about the cheapest to deliver, not so much, not so much at all. So just keep that in mind. Mm -hmm.